Welcome to the Develop Yourself podcast, where we teach you everything you need to land your first job as a software developer by learning to develop yourself, your skills, your network, and more. I'm Brian, your host. Hey, you. In the show notes of this episode, I have a link to invite you to a special event with me and Aaron Cordova, who was a recent guest on the podcast, who went from rapper working for the New York City Transit, hammering rails into the ground to working at some of the biggest names in tech. He has nothing to sell you, but he does want to let you know how he transitioned into tech from a very non-traditional path and hopefully offer you some practical advice that will help you on your own path. Click the link in the show notes, which will be hosted on LinkedIn, and I can't wait to see you there. And now, back to the show. I was online reading LinkedIn like usual, and I came across this post, and I've read a few versions of this post. It goes a little something like this. It says, no one should use JavaScript on the back end. It's a recipe for disaster. And I think, no, it's Totally not, because companies like NASA, Netflix, Uber, LinkedIn, Trello, Walmart, PayPal, they all use it. But what do they know, right? What do they know? Some genius on X or LinkedIn, they obviously know more with their 10-person startup that you should never use JavaScript on the back end. It'll just lead to a trail of tears. But I'm not here to argue with you about what the best programming language is or why it's JavaScript or why the best framework is React. I'm here to give you a path to go from front end to back end and become a full stack engineer. I see this as increasingly more important. And at the program, which I own, Parsity, we've been doing this for quite a while. In fact, many of our students go on to do strictly back end, which I think is really cool. And unlike a lot of other boot camp programs out there, I don't even like to say boot camp in the same word as Parsity because it just feels kind of icky nowadays. At one point, boot camps in the United States decided to all just go all in on the front end. And I have a theory on this. The front end is sometimes seen as easier, which I kind of resent because most of my career has been doing mostly front end stuff. I've definitely done a lot of full stack. I'm currently a senior full stack engineer. And I think that the front end gets a lot of hate and also people trivialize it. They say, oh, that's easy. CSS and adding colors and buttons and junk like that. And the front end is wildly complex. So before I start off on why you should learn back. And I don't want to trivialize or degrade people that know front end and that's their specialty. I think that's increasingly more complex. And I think that it involves so many things that people don't even think about. Things like search engine optimization, loading time for a page, accessibility, all the JavaScript logic and web workers and browser stuff you have to do, compatibility with other browsers. There is so much to do on the front end nowadays that if you think it's easy, you probably just haven't done anything interesting or complex yet. And that's not your fault. But before you just start bashing on the front end people, think for a bit, how much do you really know about what front end is like nowadays? Anyway, many boot camps decided to teach people front end because it was quote unquote easier. And the reason why it's easier to teach is because it doesn't require a lot of tooling to set up. JavaScript can run directly in your browser. You don't need any special tools to run it. You don't need a database. You don't need to use these third-party tools in order to learn JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. That's a reason why Scrimba or Codecademy or all these other tools out there on the web that teach you how to code, they mostly focus on the front end. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. But you... You right here listening, if you don't know backend, you're doing yourself a big disservice. One, it's going to help you talk with your teammates and understand a bit more of the full software development life cycle and how the data that you get on the front end interacts with or is related to the data on the back end. It's just going to give you a much fuller, broader perspective and have a stronger foundation than only knowing the front end, in my opinion. And purely from an economic standpoint, you want to be a full stack developer. They are in high demand. Front-end developers are decreasing year by year, it feels like. And that is backed up by some statistics based on the Stack Overflow survey that came out, which I've talked about in previous episodes, if you don't believe me. I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my hat. I'm not just basing it on some anecdotal stories I read or some dudes in my circle or whatever. I'm telling you what the market trends are telling all of us, that full stack is where you want to be. There's many reasons for this. Larger tech companies, if you didn't know, went through a bit of a hiring freeze and a bit of a layoff deal, right? They kind of they kind of really started liking layoffs, it felt like. But that doesn't mean that people aren't hiring developers. Remember, these big companies that take up all the news, they make up like a solid 1% of all the software developers out there. So they employ so few of us, yet they take up so much news. So where are all these other developers going nowadays? 
Well, they're going to smaller startups. They're going to industries which typically didn't hire software engineers. And they're finding themselves needing to do more than they used to do. At a massive company like Facebook or Netflix or Google, or just pick one out there that you know of, right? You can bucket people into front end, back end, DevOps, all these nice little categories, and you just work on this button. And that's not hyperbole either. I'm not like exaggerating beyond belief here. I've known some people that work at both Meta and Google, and it's not uncommon apparently, maybe someone can correct me out there if I'm wrong, for you to literally work on something like a button and some functionality that is very, very, very particular and small in scope for up to a year. Not uncommon apparently for that to be really how you work. Now, other companies, like I'm at a small startup right now, I'm one of four engineers on a team. We build massive features and release them every single day. And we release them every single day, meaning it could be a CSS change, could be a database schema change, it could be an API route. And that's kind of how most of my career has been. And that's how most of your careers will likely be as well. So if you're only learning front end, I wanna tell you that it's not actually as hard as you think to learn some back end. And if you know JavaScript, you're halfway there. But I wanna give you a very practical guide on how to get there. So without further ado, let's talk about how you can learn some backend, what that means, and how you can get your feet wet, your hands dirty, whatever analogy you're looking for to understand backend in a practical way. First off, what is frontend? What is backend? Those words get tossed around so often nowadays. It's like, I'm a frontend engineer. I'm a backend engineer. And then you read somebody saying, full stack engineers don't really exist and no one's truly a full stack engineer. If I'm being completely honest with you, which is a little bit embarrassing, I didn't really get what front end or back end was when I first got hired as a software developer, right? Those terms were not exactly new back then, 10, 12 years ago, but they weren't as commonly used as they are now. So when I say front end or when people talk about front end, generally they're talking about the stuff you interact with on a web page, the stuff you see. You go to a website, there's HTML, there's CSS, there's JavaScript. There are too many podcasts, too many articles, too many services out there for you to use to learn those things. Now, the back end, which is often what intimidates people that are especially non traditional, coming out of boot camps, teaching themselves, this is what they often want to avoid like the plague. And I think I know why. Because there's no interface, there's nothing for you to see and interact with, in quotes, because there really is, but we'll get to that in just a minute. So, the back end is what you could call server side logic. It could mean everything from the databases to the APIs, the stuff that you can't see, which contains the logic to make a website work. So for example, let's say you're on Instagram and on the front end of Instagram is a picture of some dude tanning on the beach and you are clicking the like button or the dislike button or leaving a mean comment because you're a jerk. I don't know, but you're somehow transmitting that data somewhere, right? You leave the comment, you leave the heart, you leave something and you put your phone away, you come back, that data is still there. That like is still there for everybody to see, to embarrass you later when your wife or your husband sees it and say, hey, why'd you like that picture over there? And you're like, why, what the hell? How'd that stay on there? The way that it stays on there is from the front end, that data, that like or whatever, is transmitted to the back end. And the back end is a server, literally a computer sitting out there somewhere on a farm, literally more likely a warehouse that Jeff Bezos owns. Amazon has tons of web servers, these computers that are sitting all around the planet, and they will house all sorts of information. And what these do is they will take that like, that data that you transmitted to them, and they will store that in a database. And that database will be the record-keeping system to maintain that like, that thing forever, or for however long they want to. And when data crashes happen, this is a huge deal, because that's when you lose data or people leak it, and they get your passwords and all sorts of stuff. So That is a very loose and light definition of front end versus back end. And now you're thinking, wow, that back end stuff sounds like, I don't know, kind of, kind of weird, kind of like you don't really get it. Like what is the black box sitting somewhere? What is the code doing? How do you interact with it? We'll get to that in just a second. So I'm making some assumptions about you. One that you know a little bit of JavaScript. And if you don't know any JavaScript at all, and you just like listening to shows about people talking about code for whatever reason, uh, you should learn some JavaScript for sure. That is like the bare minimum requirement to doing anything and even to being remotely hireable nowadays. And if you don't know that, join dev30.xyz, dev30.xyz, 
Or, you know what, just go on Codecademy or Scrimber or something like that. Dev30 is a program that involves me, a director of engineering, and a group of people, and we learn to code and also learn how to have an online presence and do all the things that are necessary to learn to code by becoming the kind of person that can learn to code. But enough of that kind of plug. Here's what you should be doing if you know JavaScript already and you want to get involved with writing backend code. You're going to need to use Node and Express. This is very, very simple to download. You can literally go to node, you can literally go to nodejs.org and download Node.js. Now, Node.js is this confusing thing because it looks like JavaScript, it feels like JavaScript, it's not JavaScript. Node.js is actually a platform, it's a runtime environment. It basically allows you to write JavaScript. So you're writing JavaScript within the runtime, within the environment of Node.js. So you're writing JavaScript, but this JavaScript can do server side stuff. It can do backend stuff. Let's do a little thought experiment here. What's the difference between the front end and the back end? We went over a little bit of that. Front end is stuff you interact with, you click around on a web browser, and the back end is literally that black box that's sitting out there waiting for requests, usually from a front end. Now, what can a front end do that a back end can't do? Think about the window. <laughs> Quite literally, when you're looking at your computer, you're looking at a screen, right? The screen has a window object. If you open up the browser tools and you open up your console and you type in window, it has all sorts of interesting things in there. You have CSS, you have styling, you have things that users can interact with, you have a button that you can click. Think, would that work on a server? No, right? So what do servers have that browsers don't have? Well, they have file systems. They have memory management. They have file systems. They have ports that can listen for incoming requests. They can access databases. They can process large amounts of data, way larger than you could ever fit in your browser because your browser is basically constrained to the memory that it has. And all sorts of other things are competing for that memory. All the tabs you have open, all those things you're going to close later, that really important article you're going to get back to later. All those things are open and hogging up memory. Now, a server is running maybe on Jeff Bezos's farm somewhere has a lot more power than your browser can have. So you can do things like process really large files or CSV files or videos and all sorts of cool stuff. So that's why you might want to run code on a server to do things that you just can't do in a browser. And also a browser is really not a safe environment because anybody could have access to your computer. And if you have something in local storage or, so have I sold you yet? Have I sold you on why the back end is so cool and why you might want to do something with it? If I haven't yet, think about this too. You have a front end app. You are constrained. You are very, very limited with what you can do with a simple front end application right? You can get some data from an external source. Maybe you could have a file that has some data, but what happens when a person wants to save something? What good is an application nowadays if you can't save a user's profile or have a login or get some data from somewhere? Or if they like a picture, when they come back 20 days later, that picture should still be liked. So what do you do? Node Express to the rescue. Now, setting up Node and Express is really simple. And because I like you, and because you're probably really good looking if you're listening to this podcast, I have a little gift for you. Go down to the show notes and there's a Node Express starter. This is some code that I wrote that's gonna help you create a simple API that you can run on your local machine and you can interact with. And there are notes and a little readme and some instructions on what to do and some next steps to do with that. But for the purposes of this episode, I'm not going to get really deep into that kind of thing because that's something you really want to do hands on and not just listen to somebody talk about. So now that you have Node.js downloaded on your computer, you want to get Express. Express is the most popular library for Node.js. Remember, Node.js is this runtime. It's this environment where you can write the JavaScript, which you're used to writing, that goes in your browser. But now you can write it and it does servery side stuff. Remember, you know files, data, access to databases, and all this kind of stuff. And now you can write a program that can interact with your front end. So a great way to do this would be to create an API. API stands for Application Programming Interface. That's not a really useful term, though, is it? It's kind of like, okay, well, what does that mean exactly? Think about the web and how that works, right? You type in a URL. 
What happens when you type in a URL? You go to google.com or ilovecheeseburgers.com, whatever weird stuff you're into. You type that in, that URL, that request is sent to a server. The server is listening for that request and it returns you what? HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. Your browser knows just what to do with these files. It says, cool, I'm gonna take these files and I'm gonna present you a beautiful or an ugly web page. whatevs, right? What about an API? The same rules apply, but something different is returned this time. And I'm gonna talk about the most common way that an API works. If you're listening to this and like, well, that's not quite true. An API can do several different things. I'm gonna tell you what the majority of them do and what you're likely gonna be doing with them. So same thing applies, same little dance you're doing. You have a URL, but this time that URL is pointing at an API. It might be something like api.cats.com. It's URL, it could, be, it could be literally anything, right? It could be whatever you want. That URL sends a request to a server. Same server out there listening for a request. It's saying, oh, that's me. That's my unique address. Remember, all URLs are unique. It's like an address, like a, literally like a home address out there. So that URL will travel out to that destination, that server. Now this time, if it's an API request, that's not going to return you a page or some files. It's going to return you JavaScript object notation. For all intents and purposes, this is an array full of objects. And if you're curious what this looks like or how this is really done, go to almost any website that you normally go to, open up the browser tools and go to the network tab. And then finally, filter the requests by XHR. This will show you the network requests that are coming in. And you can often see what these look like by clicking on the preview for a particular URL request. And you can see what's in there. And you'll see something that looks like a bunch of arrays, arrays with objects in them. And that's how most data on the internet is transmitted. From an API request, hits a URL, the URL returns you a bunch of JSON, JavaScript object notation. But for all intents and purposes, you can think of an array with a bunch of JavaScript objects. And what can you do with that on the front end? whatever the hell you want. Now you're back to the front end land and you should know at this point kind of what to do with that stuff. You can iterate over it. You can write a for loop and iterate and console log this stuff. You could create images. Maybe the JSON has URLs that point to images like in the case of literally any site like Instagram or whatever you're into, um, Netflix, whatever these images that you could display on the screen. And then you can actually have a really cool site that is dynamic. Dynamic means it's basically custom. It's not always going to be the same. It'll take data. That data could be anything, and it will show that data based on all sorts of things, where the user's located, what language they speak. Now you have a very, very interesting app you can make. So your challenge as a front-end developer or person learning JavaScript and getting used to this back-end thing is thinking, okay, well, now I'm not just writing the code that's going directly in the browser that shows me some HTML and CSS. Now I'm going to write the code that will respond to a request on a server and send me back some JSON. You can start by just sending back something like hello world or maybe an object that contains a user right? Like you could send back a whole bunch of user objects as in the example with the challenge that's in the show notes. You can do that. And then you can think, well, what else can I do now? Now you should be thinking, well, this is kind of cool. Like it's not super hard to get a Node Express app running that is listening for requests. You can hit it, meaning you can request something from it and it will return you this JSON and return you this objects and this data. But what about when you want more data? What about when you want to save that data and store it forever? You have a couple options. You have MongoDB, and you have SQL. These are your two options, if I'm being completely honest with you. No one really uses anything else. Most startups, for some reason, use Mongo, and most coding boot camps use MongoDB as well. Parsity is no different in that respect, and I've been thinking about that a lot lately, and I'm going full in on SQL. SQL is by far and away the most popular type of database that you will use, and it's never been easier to start using SQL. In fact, I did this with a student that's interested in going to Parsity. She and I set up a SQL table. We got the connection to a Node Express app, and we were already requesting and saving data in SQL like within half an hour. It was amazing. Now, I've done this quite a few times before, so your mileage may vary, but it was way simpler than you probably would believe. It has never been easier to set up 
SQL and actually be able to query and store data in the cloud for free, which is really cool. Now, if you're not familiar with SQL or SQL, SQL is Structured Query Language. SQL tables are basically like, you can almost think of them like a CSV file, like an Excel file that lives in the cloud. I'm giving you such a limited definition of SQL here. SQL is a very large topic that I cannot cover in this podcast, but maybe I will in the future. But two services which I really like using are neon.tech. That's N-E-O-N. I'm using that at work currently. Super cool and super free. And Supabase, which I'm using for my product that I actually sell online, javascriptprosapp.com. These are similar. They are SQL databases that live in the cloud. They have a really nice, sleek interface. And for all intents and purposes, these are tables, tabular data. It feels intuitive because you've probably worked with tabular data no matter what kind of industry you're in. If you work at the front desk of McDonald's or you work as a data analyst, you're probably seeing Excel sheets at some part of your day. You have rows and you have columns of data. What you can do is create some rows and columns of data And then you can look up, how do I connect my Node Express app with my SQL database using neon.tech or Supabase or whatever you choose to use? There are many libraries out there to do this. One of which, which I find very useful is SQLize. I use Prisma at work, but I've used other things in the past and SQLize was really popular. I haven't used it for a while, but I know it's a common one that people use. So why not use it? Or use whatever the hell you want, really. It's super easy to use these tools, by the way. You'll install them using the Node command line tools, NPM, Node Package Manager. This comes standard when you downloaded Node, you should get NPM, which will allow you to download millions or maybe billions of code libraries from all around the world. So once you have that installed, you can download all sorts of cool stuff by simply typing in npm install and the name of the library. And what I would do if I wanted to find a library is just look up, you know, SQL plus Node Express and then look for whatever library has the most stars or is the most popular or people are talking about the most. It'll usually be the first one in your Google search and just use that. And what you do is you will connect to your database by using your username and some sort of password or something like that. This is often the most difficult part. But once you get this part down and you can see it working by looking at the documentation and there's kind of copying and pasting like how to get started, then it's a matter of, okay, I have the SQL database, I have the connection to my Node Express app, and I'm able to listen for incoming requests. Now what? Now I need to add some data to this SQL database. And how do I do that? This will lead you down some interesting rabbit holes. (laughs) And you shouldn't go too far. I think at a very high level, very basic level, what you want to know when you're learning SQL is how to create, update, read, and delete. This is called CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. And if you're online, you'll often hear people, the same people that hate JavaScript, hate CRUD. They're like, oh, another CRUD app, another boot camp student with a CRUD app. And I'm thinking, what do you build all day? I've worked at several companies and guess what we build all freaking day? CRUD apps. Because what do people want to do with data? Every time you're on a website, I want you to think about the data you're interacting with and what you're doing to that data. When you open up Instagram, what is happening? You are reading data. You are reading tons and tons of data. What happens when you like a photo? You are updating that data with your like. What happens when you get embarrassed by that picture you took when you were drunk last night and you want to get it offline? You delete that data. Create, read, update, delete. There's nothing that complicated about this, but that is what most of the internet does. Now, if you understand how to build the front end, how to build this back end API, and how to use that back end API to communicate with your SQL database in order to store that information forever, That is full stack land, my friend. You are there. Now, the harder part is, how do you get it from working on your machine to working out in the cloud? And how do you deploy it so other people can experience the wonder that is this API and front end that you've built? That is a whole other bag of beans. And of course, that's why people join programs like Parsity or whatever thing out there, because you need to understand how to not only have this work on your machine, but out in the cloud. That's also really simple nowadays. And if you want to get started with that, I would personally look into using render.com, maybe Netlify. AWS would be a really good choice, but it is notoriously difficult to use, which is why I am building a course on that for Parsity students and maybe for others too. I don't know. But you could also use a tool like Next.js. 
Next.js is a full stack framework, meaning you don't have to have a separate back end and a separate front end. For a lot of people, this sounds great. I would actually say maybe don't do that at first because it's not typical. Next.js is fairly new. It's definitely not a standard of the way people have been building apps for the last decade. And if you do want to learn front end and back end, I highly suggest building a back end that connects to your front end as separate applications. This is going to teach you a ton and it's going to get you much closer to being full stack than just building a lot of to-do apps that use local storage or going on a site like Scrimba or Code Academy and just writing lots of React code all day long, which is important, but it's important you get the bigger picture. I really hope that's helpful. I hope you enjoy the challenge that's connected to the show notes. And if you're feeling brave, you can even try out some of the other challenges that are in that same GitHub repo. I have one in TypeScript. I have another one with tests, all sorts of cool stuff. I love giving this thing away. I hope more people use it. I think it's a really fun way for you to get introduced to the back end. Anyway, I'll see you around. That'll do it for today's episode of the Develop Yourself podcast. To learn more about becoming a software engineer with us, then check out Parsity.io. If you're not quite ready for that, then jump into our dev30.xyz program, which is 30 days of working on your mindset, habits, and JavaScript skills. Totally worth it. See you next week.